fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. We've got uh, Cult City, Jim Jones, Harvey Milk, and 10 Days That Shook San Francisco. And the author is Daniel Flynn. Um, thank you for being here. Hey, appreciate it. So, Daniel, that's quite a title. Um, like, we do a lot of cult shows on here, and we've had a lot of people from all sorts. We actually, from the Jim Jones cult, we had someone that was on that special. And um, we've, we've covered this a lot. Um, how did you encompass so many things into one title? Like, I mean, because Harvey Malk's really kind of going from the outside. So I have to question how that name got in with Jim Jones. Well, I think... Before the poor drank the Kool-Aid in South America, in Jonestown, the powerful did in San Francisco. And Harvey Milk was certainly one of the, the, the uh, people in San Francisco who went all in on Jim Jones. I think the difference between the People's Temple cult and other cults that you may talk about is that People's Temple actually you know, w- was a major powerful force in a major great American city, San Francisco. Um, Jim Jones, for instance, was made the uh, chairman of the housing commission in San Francisco. The, the George Moscone, the mayor, appointed him chairman of the, uh, to the housing commission in San Francisco. And I think when you think about Jim Jones, you might think about, you know, you might think about some cult leader. You might think about uh, Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy or, or some uh, mass murderer you generally don't think of people like that running 35,000 public housing units in a city like San Francisco. And I think that's the difference between People's Temple and a lot of the other um, cults or, or uh, you know, kind of far out organizations that you may talk about is that Jim Jones, uh, you know, for a long period of time was a figure, uh, you know, held in, in high esteem in San Francisco and not beyond San Francisco. I mean, when Rosalind Carter came to uh, San Francisco to campaign for her husband, Jimmy Carter, uh, the person she has introduced her is, is Jim Jones. She eats dinner with Jim Jones. Um, they have, you know, they talk on the phone. Uh, we know this because Jones surreptitiously recorded the phone conversation. Um, when Walter Mondale, her husband's running mate, comes to San Francisco, one of the first person he meets is Jim Jones. Uh, so it's a very different, you know, kind of a very different vibe with people's temple because all the way up until the time that the, um, that Jones orders the mass suicide of over 900 people in, uh, in Jonestown, um, you had people, you know, praising him uh, praising Jonestown. Uh, Jane Fonda wrote Jim Jones a letter after going to services at people's temple and said she wanted to be a full and active participant in people's temple. And she wanted to do this because for the sake of her two kids, that's unusual that you would have, you know, a mass murderer enjoy the support of, you know, one of the, the you know, Academy Award winning actress, um, enjoy the support of the mayor of a great American city uh, and a figure of uh, like Harvey Milk, enjoy his support as well. So I think that's where this book differs. And I think when you understand that these people went all in for Jim Jones, you kind of understand why all those people got fooled in South America a little better, too. Because it wasn't just, you know, the urban underclass that went for this guy, but it was a lot of people that, um, you know, had great reputations that thought Jim Jones was, uh, you know, the, the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah, but I'm still trying to figure out how they can, um, how Malk justifies being on the title. Uh, you know, because at the time when they were being supported and being, you know, they, they he was preaching the Lord and love and all this shit. Oh, my. No, not re- no, he wow. wasn't. <laughs> well, he, he, he wasn't. Before in all fact, the suicide. J- no, Jim Jones was an atheist. And in, 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 in Jonestown, I talked to several people, uh, survivors, 
you know, the point that a couple of made to me was that when you when you got to Jonestown, anyone bringing in a Bible that was confiscated, and the only time that that they they got their Bibles back is when they ran out of toilet paper. And so Jim Jones instructed them how to use it, and some people use the Bible in that way. I don't know. You know, it was certainly the case that when when it was reported on initially, for instance, the New York, New York Times said he was a preacher of fundamentalist Christianity. But you listen to the death tape, and he openly talks about being an atheist. In his sermons, he openly talks about being an atheist. Uh, and I don't know any fundamentalist Christians who, who distributed Bibles as, as toilet paper. And so... That's part of the reason I wrote the book is because there's a lot of misunderstandings about Jim Jones, namely the idea that he was a Christian or that he was a, a religious figure. Um, he certainly was, you know, he was named one of the most, 100 most important religious figures by religion in American life. But I, I think most people got him wrong. And if you, and if you take the time to, to listen or, or read his sermons, you realize that he is not preaching Christianity or even religion. He's um, he's preaching what he says at one point. He says that uh, that socialism is God, and since he is the most perfect embodiment of socialism uh, on earth, that makes him God. So that's a very different kind of theology than you would get from, say, a fundamentalist Christian. Well, I'm just oh. thinking that an atheist doesn't do healings. Well, well, he yeah, he did. He definitely did healings. He claimed to have ESP. He believed in reincarnation. Um, and he, he did faith healing. So certainly the trappings of, of Pentecostal Christianity was part of People's Temple. And if you were to believe Jim Jones, and I, know, I realize he's not always the best authority on Jim Jones, but in his autobiographical sketch, which is it's tape recorded, he said that very early on, the thought occurred to him, how can I demonstrate my Marxism? And he said the way that he would do this is to infiltrate the church. This is his words. Now, I don't know how far back... His, um, you know, his lack of belief went. Um, but if you can believe him, that all along his point was to sort of use the church to advance his his political ideology. Okay, let me let me slow the roll here for just a second. Um, from what we know of, of Jim Jones, uh, you know, l- let's go back to the beginning. We have got a fundamentalist preacher in California who you know, for all intents and purposes, is a community organizer. You know, he sees good good causes in, in helping the unfortunate, helping this group, helping this group, helping this group. And I can kind of see where you're coming from, Daniel. And, you know, socialism is God. I'm the perfect embodiment of that. I, I get it. I, I get it. I completely understand it. How does he go from this point to creating himself or recreating himself as a messianic figure who is able to talk a large group of people to suddenly picking up, moving, moving to another country to create a socialist utopia? Well, I think most people who came into People's Temple, um, uh, uh, the, the largest percentage probably came for the faith healings because they believed that he could heal them, that he had, he had supernatural powers. In fact, I spoke to a guy who left People's Temple, you know, long before Jonestown. He hates Jim Jones. But when I asked him, um, when did you realize this was all, you know, a charlatan's act? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, when did you realize that the sort of the magic act was a bunch of abracadabra, that he didn't have these powers? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. So when did you realize he was a fake? And he said, oh, no, Jim Jones had powers. He had the power to heal people. He had extrasensory perception. He could um, heal people not just of sort of psychological maladies, but of physical ones. And so if someone 40 years later who hates Jim Jones still believes that the guy had power, mm-hmm. he had power of some sort. I don't believe he had any supernatural powers. But the idea that he, he was that manipulative and that persuasive that you still have people convinced today that he had these kind of powers, it, it tells you a little bit about the power he had over people in real time. Well, the power should, to get them to to get uh, to go down to South America with them, the power to get them to kill themselves uh, just at his command. Uh, and Daniel, I, I completely understand that. Having you know studied a little bit of cults myself, you know during my college years, and I'm air quoting, you know I was a, I was a psych major first. 
and, you know, found serial killers and cult leaders fascinating. But you're introducing a completely new facet here that Jim Jones, from what we know of him, you're, you are introducing a completely new aspect that he was an atheist. Yeah, the, I mean, he, that's, he, he would, you, he would throw you, the, you threw us for a loop. Well, he threw the Bible down, would stomp on it. Um, he didn't write much, but the big thing that he did write is a book, is a pamphlet called The Letter Killeth. And the whole point of that pamphlet was to reveal all the uh, contradictions of the Bible and to basically say it was false. And so that's, I mean, part of the reason I wrote the book is because there are so many misconceptions about Jim Jones. The biggest one being probably that he um, was just some, you know, uh, nutty out there Christian, you know, maybe someone from the moral majority or the 700 Club, that kind of ilk. He was not that. Um, when people joined, certainly a lot of the people who joined were Christians, and it certainly had the trappings of Pentecostal Christianity. But like most cults, there are layers to it. And certainly by the time they get down to Jonestown, everyone knows that this is explicitly uh, an anti-Christian group. They are not allowed to celebrate Christmas in Jonestown. They, um, there's no more sermonizing by Jim Jones in, in Jonestown. And as I said earlier, the Bibles are all compl- confiscated. And when you read what he says to the flock, there's, no, there's really no wiggle room. Everyone, you know, if, if you read it, you realize that this guy is preaching communism and he is an atheist. Um, and so mm. that's something a little bit different with his cult, because, you know, is it a religious cult, or is it just a cult, or just a political movement? Um, that's sort of up for debate, but what's not up for debate is the idea that he, you know, was Christian or anything like that. He was not, and he explicitly said that. You know, and, and I can see that. You know, now that, okay, <laughs> I'm wrapping my mind around what you said, because literally, Daniel, you threw us for a loop whenever you said that he was an atheist. So let me, I, I'm trying to think like a listener. If he's an atheist, I, I think maybe that's a very, very broad term. This man presented himself to be a religious figure. I am the pastor, Jim Jones. Later, he evolves. I'm Pastor Jim Jones with a very large following, and God speaks to me. He evolves later on throughout the years. I'm now an a an almost political figure. I am the Pastor Jim Jones with an extremely huge following, and people are admiring me as a religious figure. Do you think that maybe he evolved into... You know, this anything other than me is anti-Christ. I am the chosen one. I am the Messiah. I'm going to move my flock to another country where I am worshipped as Messiah. Anything else is heresy. Therefore, anything other than me is anti-Christ. Well, he he, he would not have uh, believed in Christ, but he, he certainly, what you're getting at there is, is the gist of what he told them. He said, you know, it, 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 just like you said, believing in anything else but me is blasphemy. He said those things explicitly. And so for people who believed that he had healed them of ailments or that he held these powers, um, they went all in for him. And, and so that was part of why he was able to do what he did in, in South America. Another big reason is because, you know, politically that they were indoctrinated. And so by the time they get down to South America, you know, they're wearing red. People are changing their name to Stalin and Lenin mm. in, in the uh, in the cult. They have a, a security force called the Red Brigades. They killed the, communist, uh, the congressman down there. Um, they willed their money to the Soviet Union. And there's talk of them emigrating to the Soviet Union. And when you listen to the death tape, there is one woman who stands up to him, a woman named Christine Miller, um, 60-year-old African-American. She uses logic and quite a bit of courage to try to argue him out of, you know, ordering everyone to kill themselves. And her, uh, finally, her sort of, her last card that she plays is, can't we all just emigrate to the Soviet Union? Such were the choices in Jonestown, that either A, we all kill ourselves, or B, let's go emigrate to some cold country halfway around the world that we've never been to. Um, Those are the two choices. And so that's kind of where they were 
in uh, in Jonestown. And, uh, you know, although she stood up to him, ultimately she sort of bows down, says he's, he's the one, he's the only, and she takes the poison with everyone else. But, mm. when, you know, if you have over 900 people there and there's only one adult who's saying, you know what, this is a bad idea, it shows you the effectiveness of his uh, ability to manipulate people and condition them into accepting this fate. Well, yeah, but all those things happen so slowly. Um, now, I think kind of a, a, another unique aspect of, of what we've learned, you know, when we're when we, Al and I were doing homework, you know, previous to this show, you were making comparisons, especially in your book, between Jim Jones, who is a very well-known cult leader, and we all know how that ended up, and Harvey Milk. Um, do you think that that is a fair comparison between... I, I, I don't com I, yeah, I don't compare the two of them. I, I note that they, that they were allies, that they were that Jim Jones is not able to do what he did in South America without the support of people in San Francisco, notably Harvey Milk. And so Jones is able to give politicians, take Milk, um, you know, he's able to give him hundreds of volunteers, a printing press, um, to the pulpit at People's Temple whenever Milk wants to talk, uh, free press in the People's Temple's newspaper. And, of course, a politician is going to be grateful for that. They're going to be indebted for that. In return, this sort of transactional politics, Harvey Milk gives Jim Jones something far more valuable, which is legitimacy. And so when things go south for uh, Jones in San Francisco and he goes down to South America, Harvey Milk is rattling off letters to world leaders, to, to Forbes Burnham in, uh, in Guyana, who's the prime minister there, and he's saying, such greatness I have found in People's Temple. And um, if, you are in, if you're in Guyana and... You're hearing from these discontented members of People's Temple saying what a bad guy Jim Jones is. And you're also hearing from elected leaders in the United States saying how well, a great guy he was. Who are you going to believe? You add to that the fact that in the United States, you know, there was a, a Jones had kidnapped a kid. And there was an order from a judge in California to return that kid, which Jones ignored. And so uh, fearing that the State Department was getting to get involved, Milk wrote a letter to Jimmy Carter saying that Jim Jones is a man of the highest character, that this kid's parents, who, who the kid who was kidnapped, that his mother was a blackmailer and his father was a bold-faced liar. Um, and so, you know, that kid died in, in Jonestown. There were some consequences to that kind of lobbying uh, that Milk took part in. And I think, you know, when you watch the, the Harvey Milk movie or the documentary, both of which won Academy Awards, there's no mention of the relationship between him and People's Temple. Harvey Milk really doesn't go anywhere in politics until he links up with Jim Jones. He runs for office three times. He loses. Finally, he gets the support of Jim Jones, and he has all these campaign volunteers. So it's partly due to Milk's tenacity as a political figure that he gets elected. But it's all, he also owes a debt to all these people in the temple that had helped him a great deal. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why you had people like Willie Brown or George Moscone feeling so indebted to milk. Moscone probably doesn't get elected uh, mayor of San Francisco without Jim Jones. I think everyone pretty much agrees with that. W where they disagree is whether the support was all above board um, or, you know, whether these people that he bust into San Francisco to vote, whether that was something that was the difference maker politically. And so very quickly, Moscone pays him back by, you know, giving him this post in San Francisco uh, putting him on the Housing Commission Authority, and he becomes the chairman of the Housing Commission Authority under under uh, Bastoni's administration. And so you had people like that. You had Mervyn Dimely, the, the uh, lieutenant governor of California, flying down to Jonestown with Jim Jones, saying he's tremendously impressed. You had a whole number of people go down there and basically exclaim that it was paradise. Um, obviously, it wasn't paradise. They were looking at a concentration camp, but because Jones was so helpful to them politically, they kind of believed what they wanted to believe about the guy, and they projected their own fantasies upon him. You know, and, and that's the trappings of any cult leader. And, and Daniel, I thank you, because that's exactly what we needed to hear. We didn't want the work of Harvey Milk being lost in the fog of war and, and actually being associated directly with, 
you know, a, a cult leader who was responsible for the suicide, the willing suicide of, of you know, hundreds of people. You know, his work is, is worthy to stand on its own. But I can understand what you're saying, that you, you've got this man who is fighting for the rights of a, the gay community being associated with, you know, and understandably so, he was kind of utilizing the charisma of a cult leader. But, yeah, but I, one, I think once the two were separated, we need to be able to distinguish the work of Harvey Milk from the sins of, you know, a cult leader. Well, I think that's true, and it doesn't necessarily negate uh, any of the worthy work that Harvey Milk did, but he was associated with this guy, and I think when, you know, when you're naming a, um, a, a, you know, a, a terminal at San Francisco Airport after Harvey Milk, or you have these movies that are very laudatory about Harvey Milk, the fact that you know, the biggest thing that he did in his political life was this association with Jones, and it's completely excised out of that, there's something terribly dishonest with that. And I, I think, you know, that's kind of the same vibe that you had with Jonestown. There were so many things about Jim Jones that were just wrong. People didn't want to admit it at the time because it was politically inconvenient. I think in death, people don't want to admit Milk's associations with Jones. Not just associations, but he, he's, you know, one of the biggest boosters of Jim Jones. He's certainly not the only one. You think of a guy like Herb Cain, who won the Pulitzer for being the voice and conscience of the city of San Francisco, according to the Pulitzer Committee. He is the biggest booster of Jim Jones in the media. Uh, Paul Avery, who was a reporter um, played by uh, Robert Downey Jr. in the movie Zodiac, he as well was someone who was a booster of Jim Jones. And so a lot of people who had very good reputations fell for this guy. And I think one of the takeaways from that is that you, you begin to understand why the people in, in Jonestown, who are often derided and, and ridiculed, drinking the Kool-Aid and all that kind of thing, the, the, the reality is that a lot of people uh, who were not anonymous, who were famous, who had better educations, more wealth than these people, fell for him too. But when Jim Jones and, and the Jonestown, people in Jonestown died, all of that disappeared, and he became something that he was not, a fundamentalist Christian. Walter Cronkite called him a fascist on the CBS Evening News. You had nothing in the documentaries from NBC or CBS that he was a Marxist. I mean, that was the alpha and omega of People's Temple, Marxism, and yet they don't even mention that when they have their half-hour specials after the carnage. So there was a lot of misinformation about Jonestown, and I think that what this book tries to get into is that, that in San Francisco, Jim Jones was a, a revered figure, a powerful figure, a person who officially held power, who had the governor of California, Jerry Brown, speak at People's Temple, Ed, uh, Tom Bradley, the mayor of, of Los Angeles, spoke at the temple in Los Angeles. He was cavorting with some very powerful figures. All of that gets flushed down the memory hole once, you know, over 900 people kill themselves en masse because these politicians are running from him. They're acting like they didn't know him. Um, mm -hmm. Willie Brown wrote to um, uh, Fidel Castro asking him to extend a state visit to Jim Jones as though he were a world leader. Uh, when he came to Cuba. Now, Castro didn't do that, but Willie Brown is writing him saying that Jim Jones is a highly trusted brother in the, in the struggle for liberation. In, a, in another venue, he tells an audience that Jim you know, compares him to Martin Luther King. And, I was uh, going to get Gandhi. to that. I was going to get and, to Martin Luther King. Well, and, and, and then if you look at, at Brown's autobiography, which he, he wrote about a decade ago, he acts as though you know he was detached from Jim Jones, that Jones was sort of a stranger to him, that was all confusing to him. He was very much a big part of the reason why Jim Jones was able to fool so many people because people like Willie Brown and Harvey Milk and George Moscone vouched for this guy's character, were very aggressive in promoting Jim Jones, that people were able to fall for Jim Jones. So, you know, is, is it the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart? I mean, you know, how many people have done this? You know, let's, let's honestly look at Pat Robertson, who has kind of attached himself to a lot of political figures. Now, this is a man who is very well respected within the religious community. This is a man who has claimed to have performed miracles. We have miracles on video, and I, I'm air quoting, I'm being very, very careful here. 
and yet he has attached himself to high political figures. Now, we can just easily wave it off and just say, ah, this is a religious figure who wants to, you know, connect himself to politics. Yet, in with Jim Jones, it, you know, let's be real intellectually honest here, Daniel. We have got a man, and, and this is what makes it so unique to me. We have got a man who has deified himself and has been able to convince multiple people not only to give up their worldly possessions, which is fairly common in cults, but to move themselves to a foreign country and subjugate themselves to, to him and his whims. And only one, one political figure sees fit to fly a plane down there and actually observe the claims. Now, well, are, well, there were some others. There were some you, others that went down down there. Um, were you going to add something? Well, no, no. I, I, I was just going to continue my my point. You know, what sway did Jim Jones have? Really, that only one one political figure was willing to say, you know what? Maybe I was wrong. I need to go down there and check out, you know, I, I'm vicariously responsible for the, my constituents and go down are, there are and you, observe. You're talking about uh, the lieutenant governor, Mervyn Dimely, or are you talking yes. about Leo Ryan? Well, there, well were other, there, were other, there were other figures who went down there in addition to Dimely. Um, you know, his lawyer, Charles Gary, for instance, um, went down there and he said it was paradise. There was no racism, sexism, or homophobia down there. There were other people that, that did actually go down there. And obviously Leo Ryan, the congressman from California, who's murdered by Jim Jones' henchman, he goes down there as well. But, obviously, you know, that's 5,000 miles away. You're not going to get too many people who do fly down there. But I, I think the point about Jones, you know, most of his uh, malfeasance was exposed in 1972 by a reporter named Lester Consolving. And his, his um, series, it was an eight-part series, ran in the uh, San Francisco and Examiner. And it was, it was cut off uh, under pressure after four installments. Um, and so a lot that he exposed at the time, people sort of laughed it off because Consolving was a controversial figure. You know, in later years, he used to ask some strange questions at, at White House briefings. Um, but people didn't listen to him at the time. And when people came out and, and, and said things about Jones, that he was, you know, a, a phony or that he had pressured people to turn over their houses to him or that he was forcing himself sexually on, on various members, um, it was all dismissed. Even when, you know, the reason he goes down to South America, there's a, a, um, a, a, an article that comes out in New West Magazine. And basically... The article says everything that that um, that Consolving had said five years ago, but it's from you know um, I guess more respected journalists. It comes out, and at the time, uh, Jones used a number of his political friends to pressure New West to cancel that, and they did. And Harvey Milk was one of them that contacted New West and told them to kill that article. They did kill the article. They got a new editor in. They went with the article, and once that article was ready to come out. That's when Jones flees to South America, and that's when he tells his people to come follow him, and they, they all come follow him. And so um, there was a weird, weird relationship with the press where for years they had enabled Jim Jones, but the moment that they started exposing him, um, like a lot of bullies, he's very thin-skinned, he's very sensitive, and so he flees, fearing you know, public scandal, fearing um, you know, legal repercussions. He goes down to South America... And in Guyana, where you have a communist government running it, and he's out in the middle of the jungle, far away from that government, he's able to, you know, conduct himself um, to commit these crimes with impunity because they're not able, you know, there's really no power over him. And so that's sort of an ideal setting for a guy like him, you know, out in the middle of the jungle, away from the powers. Right. Um, he can pretty much do whatever he wanted to do. Now, w would you say that this was more to feed his ego to... You know, I mean, <laughs> Daniel, I mean, look at you. You've got the perfect storm. You've got believers who now believe that you are deity. 
You are the son of God. You have performed miracles. You've got the backing of political figures. You've got everything. And now I need to isolate you from the real world because, you know, you've got media out there. You've got radio. You've got television. You've got, you know, biblical teachers who may contradict you. So this is perfect control. Let me get control of you within your cities. Now I'm going to move you over here. I am now deity. I mean, this is absolutely rich. How did, you know, within your research, how did people fall for this? Well, I think one of the things that he does in Jonestown, in, in, in talking to survivors, talking to people who got out, um, several of them said that the worst thing about, I mean, these are people that said they didn't eat any meat down there. They were eating rice soup every day. You know, there's all sorts of horrible things going on, but several of them said the worst thing about it was his constant harangues on the loudspeaker system in Jonestown. So he was speechifying and, you know, basically reading the news or reading propaganda to people, telling them falsehoods that there was, you know, that they were already setting up concentration camps in the United States and the United States, there's terrible poverty there now and you don't want to go back. And so that's the only information that they're getting. They're getting it from Jim Jones. That's certainly part of it. Another big part of it started in the United States in 1975, and I spoke to several people who were there. Um, Jones uh, conducted something called the wine test, where he gave wine to some of his elite followers, you know, the, the planning commission, and then informed them that they were going to die within 45 minutes because it contained poison. Now, the description of what happened, at one point there was a lady, um, one of his followers from Indiana, an, an older, overweight woman, who started freaking out and going crazy. And so one of his supporters um, appears to shoot her a number of times. Now, the, the, she was in on the act, and it was blank. Um, but the, the message there is pretty clear that no, you know, nobody died from the wine test. Everyone took the poison, but he said, look, you know, there's no poison. I just, this was just a loyalty test. The one person who, who bucks his loyalty is embarrassed, is shamed, is sort of ostracized. People believe she was, she had been shot. And so that kind of thing conditions people to accept what he's doing. Just drink the wine or drink the Kool-Aid. Nothing's going to happen. Only something bad will happen is if, if you rebel. And so these tests go on. And in, in South America, he starts uh, conducting something called White Nights, which is the siege mentality. Sometimes it would last days at a time where he tells the people on loudspeaker that they're under attack from external forces, shadowy forces that are beyond the perimeter of Jonestown, that they're ready to invade and they're going to kill all their children. And so everyone sort of gets in the siege mentality and it lasts for a few right. days and then, it, and then it's over. This goes on for quite some time. And so there's a great deal of conditioning that leads to mass suicide, to revolutionary suicide, what he, is what he termed it. And um, this conditioning and the fact that you have people with guns and archers surrounding the, the community that's in the pavilion, all of these things, I think, persuade people to, to drink what was flavor aid with, with uh, Valium and uh, cyanide. They had a, basically, they, it was a penny's worth of cyanide for each person. Uh, who died. That's how cheap it was and how efficient it was is that you had, you know, 900 and I think nine people died by poisoning um, within Jonestown and it all takes less than three hours. <laughs> You're describing a prepper mentality. <laughs> oh, Daniel. I'm a guy with guns. I food prep. But uh, no, I, I'm, I'm just trying, I'm trying to, you know, put a little bit of humor in such a dire situation. Um, now let's let's roll it back just a little bit. Miracles, it, because that you know I, I'm high centered on that as I've listened to the story of of Jones, Jim Jones, and you're absolutely right. You know he did a lot of public works. He was a public, you know. He was such a public figure, but it's the miracles who is, that, that is going to get anybody to believe that he is deity. Yeah, that's that's a big part of it, and I think part of this was that they would, you know, they would break into people's homes, find out 
what foods they ate, what drugs they were, were taking, what medications they were taking. Um, they would rummage through their trash and find out information about them. And so Jones, when he would present himself to the congregation, uh, he would tell people all things about them that they would think, how could he know this kind of thing? Um, so they believed, he, they believed he was the supernatural force. He claimed very specifically to raise dozens and dozens of people from the dead. He said, look, if you, if you die, please instruct in your will to not use embalming fluid because I can't help you at that point. I can only help the people who don't use the embalming yeah. fluid. This is how many people I've helped. And, and, so and he's right. Les and and, and so he's Les right. He, he's but, right how? Well, you know, no, no, he's right. You know, if you use embalming fluid, it, it, it's over. I mean, let's let's start to think like one of the parishioners of Jim, you know, Jim Jones. You know, well, I, I have seen what you're able to do so far. These political figures, you know, they believe in you. You know, they have validated you. Now, miracles are validating you. Now, now I'm going to make a very careful comparison here, Daniel. And, and, and follow me. Because listening to everything that you have said so far. And, man, you just now hit it. You hit the final point. You, this was the catalyst. You've got people rummaging through people's garbage in order to find out personal information about them. Now, would it be a fair comparison? Let's look at some of the followers of Jim Jones. You know, let's, let's take Jonestown and let's compare it to modern day Scientology. Who, well, I, you know, I don't know. I, all I know about Scientology is what uh, Leah Remini talks about, and I, I watch her show occasionally. Um, but obviously, I think that the, they're both sort of closed systems. There are some correspondence between um, Joan, the leadership in People's Temple and some of the people in Scientology at that point. Um, and so there was, in the 70s, there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, it, 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 there's kind of a hangover after the high of the 1960s. And a lot of people who realized that drugs and sex and all that kind of thing weren't doing it for them, they looked to religion. Specifically, they looked to a lot of new religions. And so People's Temple was very part, very much a part of that zeitgeist where people were, were trying to find some meaning in their lives. And a lot of that was going on in the 70s. And a lot of it was going on in, in California. And so I think people who were kind of turned off by traditional religion, um, they might have explored some of these new religions. Now, most of these new religions are not harmful in the way that, that uh, People's Temple was. Um, but I think Jones, <coughs> seeing religion, I mean, he was a Marxist. He believed, you know, he, the idea that religion was the opiate of the masses, he really, really believed that. And I think, you know, in some ways, his, his life's work uh, validated that to an extent. I, some of the, the people who were following him um, knew that, um, you know, that, that, that the, the faith healings were hoaxes. And so they looked at this as sort of him using that religion as the opiate of the masses, turning it on its, on its head by using religion to bring people over to Marx. And so people would sit through these three-hour harangues about socialism mm -hmm. to get healed. The people who were more into the political part would stomach this kind of um, charlatan act where he was pretending to heal people uh, in order to, to get the politics shoved down people's throat. And so there was two different kind of people that were in Jonestown. Some of the people were there for the healings, and there was another part, a smaller part, that were there for the politics. And I think in both instances, there was an ends justify the means mentality where they sat through the part that they found distasteful in order to, to, you know, get the part that they that they were there for. Well, here's why I'm why I'm making the comparison. You know, you, you have a religion that is high profile. It's validated by, you know, political and, you know, perhaps some Hollywood celebrities. And it is making, you know, bombastic claims and it practices isolationism. Yeah, and I think that's probably the mark of, of all cults, that any time that the, the, the leader is claiming to be God or that the leader is isolating people from their friends and family, which was certainly the case in Jonestown and certainly the case in People's Temple, you, know, you might be in a cult if that's what's going on. 
there was one guy I talked to who Jones had kidnapped from Indiana when he was a little boy, brought him out to, to California. And in junior high, he got a crush on a girl, and he said that she was you know, very well endowed for a girl in junior high, and she was so beautiful, and he had a crush on her. And the word got back to the temple, and they took him, and they shoved his head in a toilet. And pretty soon, he didn't have a crush on that girl. And so, you know, that's just one instance. But that's what, you know, you're going to get mistreated if all of a sudden you have relationships with people outside of, of the group. And I think the reason that they do that is pretty obvious, because when you have these outside influences, you might start to question uh, the group. You might start to question the sanity of it all. And so they were very, they were very much kept isolated. Um, and they were, you know, in, in Jonestown, that was obviously easily, easier to do. But even in, even in the United States, you know, if, there, if, you know, if this kid, junior high kid, has a crush on a girl and they're shoving his head in the toilet, it shows you the lengths that they would go to isolate members from non-members. What, what, what was his tie to Russia? You mentioned about the Soviet Union and that, other than the communism. Uh, well, I, you know, that was what he had told them. They were, they were learning Russian in, in, in Jonestown that when things were not really going well in Jonestown, I mean, if you think about it, even leave the socialism aside, the fact that you're going to take essentially city people and put them in a foreign country in the jungle and try to make them farmers, that's not a recipe for success. And they weren't too successful there. And so he talked about them going en masse to the Soviet Union to live. Um, the, the, in jo and, and in preparation for this, as I said before, you had people in Jonestown changing their last names to Stalin and Che and uh, Lenin, and some of them changing them to Jim Jones. You had, you had one guy change his name to Ken Norton because he was very good. They had these temple boxing matches where you had, they pitted very weak people who had transgressed the rules against strong people, and they would you know, get beat up. And one of the guys who was successful at this, they, he changed his name to Ken Norton because Ken Norton obviously was a big heavyweight at the time. Um, and so all this was going on in, in Jonestown. I, I, for, for, for Jones, he had talked about the Soviet Union being the spiritual motherland of, of People's Temple. And so there was a lot of talk about them going over there. They, they host a delegation from the Soviet Union in um, People's Temple. And a lot of the people who were talking to them, um, you know, for instance, like Angela Davis or Huey Newton, when they're taught, when they're addressing the members of People's Temple in Jonestown via, via phone patch, um, you know, that is sort of stirring up this kind of um, uh, communist outlook. Um, certainly Angela Davis, you know, um, you know, was a hardcore communist, obviously ran for president, vice president in the Communist Party with Gus Hall a number of times. And so you had people who were communists addressing them, and that was the, the, you know, they weren't talking about Christianity anymore. They were talking about communism in these, in these sermons. Did, did, did Russia have um, any thoughts? Do you know if they had any thoughts on Jim Jones or any of that? Well, government? when, you know, what was interesting is Pravda, in the aftermath of, of, um, of Jonestown, um, they ridiculed the Western press coverage, uh, and I think kind of rightly, you know, broken clock is right twice a day. And so they said, in effect, that the Western press was acting as though these people killed themselves because they were religious fanatics. But the reality is, you know, and this is the part that's, you know, that, that they killed themselves because of the hopelessness of, of Western civilization, all that kind of thing. Um, so, that, you know, they were wrong about the second part, but the first part they, they were right about. And Jones, in, 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 you know, presenting revolutionary suicide, revolutionary suicide, what they actually did, this came from a book that Huey Newton wrote in 1973 called Revolutionary Suicide. And in Newton's telling, um, reactionary suicide would be sort of a suicide of submission, where you just, you know, the situation's hopeless and you just give up and kill yourself, whereas revolutionary suicide would be something where you'd give your life uh, for this cause to bring about a greater world. Now, I don't think Jim Jones interpreted, I, I, I think Newton's book was idiotic to begin with, but I don't think Jones's interpretation was a fair interpretation. Um, but even the final act, uh, when you, you know, it's dressed up in this sort of uh, noble ideological language, you know, that it was not an act of nothingness, but they were really giving their lives as a, you know, as Jones said, to protest the conditions of an inhumane world, that this was going to be seen as an act of rebellion against capitalism and with something that would give glory to communism. And then you listen to the death tape, you hear various people 
um, enthusiastically endorsing Jones's idea and saying what an honor it is to give life to socialism, to communism, that kind of thing. Um, and so part of the seduction of what he was doing was that he was playing to the ideological prejudices of the people that were down there, that they had been indoctrinated into this ideology. And so he dressed it up as some sort of grand political act rather than just this meaningless act of, of uh, you know, self-abnegation where you have you know, over 900 people kill themselves. It's tough to make that seem glorious. But you know, part of the, the, the reason they were persuaded, apart from being conditioned, apart from their terrible conditions down there, the fa fact that they were surrounded by gunmen, part of it was that they were true believers as well. And he, he you know, fed them a line that they were willing to, to accept. So what do you hope everybody gets out of your book? So when they, when they, when they pick up your book and read it, what is, the, what is the major thing that you want them to get? Well, I think truth for its own sake, is a good thing. And I think a lot of people um, present facts to persuade people one way or the other, but sometimes just presenting the facts is, is really all that you need. And I think someone reading the book, I think most people uh, are going to get a story that they've never heard before. In fact, they've probably heard a story that's, that's the, the opposite of this. And so I think that's the main thing, is just to present the truth. But, you know, the, the, the lessons there, I think there are some clear ones, that the ends do not justify the means, um, that you should question authority. And I think on a related note to question authority, and it may seem contradictory, that I think it, it's, it's important to have an authority over you, whether it's a system of ethics or a god or religion or something like that. Um, Jim Jones lacks humility. He, he was a narcissist. He was someone that, um, you know, saw other people as sort of extensions of his own body. And when they departed, when they left Jonestown, the way it was explained to me is he felt like his own body was being ripped apart because he had sort of, um, his own vision of himself encompassed other human beings. And uh, that's a very dangerous view to have. And so I think someone who believes there is some higher authority, be it ethics or God, uh, they're not going to. They're not going to go in for something like that. And I think that is is a big lesson as well. Great. Now, do you have a website or information for people if they want to come look you up? Um, well, the book's called Cult City: Jim Jones, Harvey Milk, and Ten Days at Shook San Francisco. That's the main thing I would want people to be interested in reading the book. You know, we've touched on just a little bit of it. I do have a website, FlynnFiles.com. More informational. I don't update it very often. And I write for a publication called The American Spectator, which is at spectator.org. But the, the main thing is, you know, the book is Cult City, and uh, I'm hoping to get people interested in that. We just got a very good review from The Wall Street Journal, and so, um, you know, people are, people are paying attention to it. Great. Well, we'll have that linked up to our site as well. So our guest has been Daniel Flynn. Thank you very much. Appreciate Daniel, it. Thanks, thank guys. You. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.